Si vous pensez que vous avez une maladie incurable, si vous le pensez vraiment, vous avez raison. Si vous pensez que votre maladie est guérissable, vous avez aussi raison. La science a reconnu qu'au moins un tiers de toutes les guérisons, y compris les médicaments, la chirurgie et les autres interventions allopathiques, n'a rien à voir avec la méthode, mais tient de l'effet placebo. L'effet placebo est une autre façon de parler du pouvoir d'auto-guérison du corps. Et tout système qui libérera plus de ce pouvoir sera un meilleur système. La médecine informationnelle, la médecine qui utilise l'information et change l'information perturbée, c'est la médecine du futur. Regardez un patineur sur glace. Il peut faire certaines choses qui sont indescriptibles en termes d'impulsion nerveuse. Nous avons besoin d'une théorie basée sur le champ pour expliquer comment le système nerveux, dans toute sa complexité, peut coordonner tout ce qui se passe dans le corps. Nos cerveaux également ne fonctionnent pas de la façon que nous avons apprise à l'école. L'apprentissage ne se situe pas là, la mémoire là, le langage ici. Ce n'est pas là et ce n'est nulle part ailleurs. Ces aspects sont diffus à travers nos cerveaux. Nous y avons accès par le champ. Cela faisait peut-être dix ans que j'avais ces terribles maux de tête qui devenaient de pire en pire et on a diagnostiqué un prolactinome. J'ai fait mon analyse de sang de routine et je suis allée voir mon spécialiste. À ma surprise, mes niveaux d'hormones étaient complètement normaux. Et lorsque mon docteur les a vus, il a dit « C'est incroyable !» Cela ne peut vouloir dire qu'une chose, votre tumeur a disparu. Un des éléments fondamentaux qui doit changer dans la médecine du futur est cette focalisation sur les gènes comme solution à toute maladie. Les gènes ne contrôlent pas notre biologie. On a besoin d'une nouvelle façon d'expliquer comment nous nous comportons, comment nous interagissons et comment nous guérissons. La matière est de l'énergie compressée. Les informations sont des modèles d'énergie. Il y a dans notre corps un flux d'informations. La régulation même de tout l'organisme et de toutes les cellules, la coordination de toutes les cellules se fait grâce à ces champs d'informations, ces champs d'ondes scalaires. Le cœur génère de loin le signal rythmique et électromagnétique le plus important du corps. Si on regarde ce champ magnétique comme une onde porteuse, il est modulé par de l'information. Nous pensons que la guérison, c'est se lever d'un fauteuil roulant, recouvrir la vue, entendre à nouveau, se libérer d'un cancer, etc. Et ces choses se produisent, elles se produisent. Il est temps que l'on parle de ces nouvelles formes de guérison au sein des débats officiels, dans le but de créer un système de santé optimal. Five-year-old Dimitri was born with cerebral palsy. There is no medical cure for this condition. When Dimitri was born, the doctors told us he might never be able to walk, never be independent, that he would have, since this was a chronic disease, certain damage to his health that he might never recover from. 
We had not tried any alternative. Personally, I trusted nothing but the standard approaches. Until some people we trusted, because we knew them well, told us about Eric. We think of healing as getting up out of wheelchairs, vision returning, hearing returning, cancers disappearing, all sorts of things. And these things happen. They happen. The idea initially was just to attend a seminar that might show us some ways to help Dimitri as a family. This little boy's parents came up and said, well, I do a healing session after a presentation that I gave. And I said, well, they're closing the room, but let me finish signing these books and we'll get them to keep the room open for just a little bit longer. What's wrong? And they explained he had cerebral palsy. After the seminar was completed, they met for the first time, just for a short while, about 10 or 15 minutes. There's something in cerebral palsy that's very common where your feet, instead of your feet being able to be flat on the ground, the heel was up. So his heel would not be able to touch the ground. He was scheduled for surgery for that. He had to wear supports and braces. For him to be able to get up, he'd have to hold on to furniture or people's clothing. For him to be able to go down any steps at all, he'd have to sit down on the steps and push himself down a step at a time. And to go up, he'd have to crawl on his hands and knees. We stepped on the stage with Dimitri, put him on the bed that was there, and told him that he should stay calm and collaborate with Eric, and that nothing would happen that might bother him. It was strange for us to think that this man was trying to heal him using his hands, and yet without actually touching him. He got up after four minutes and was not just walking, he was jumping and he was running. It was a huge surprise and a great joy for us. But at the same time, we were left wondering, how does this all work so fast, so directly and so effectively? He was walking properly, not standing on his tiptoes and there was no need for anyone to help him climb the stairs, which was what usually happened. Other children may naturally walk up and down the stairs every day, but Dimitri was unable to do this, so accomplishing such things is very important for him. They brought him back down for another session. He had one hand that was closed. I didn't know. He looked at me in Greek. He said, look, I can open my hand. He was just five. He said, it doesn't hurt anymore. He said, look, I can hold a glass and drink by myself. Now his fist is open. It is relaxed and cooperates with the left hand much better, which is very helpful. It's not closed into a fist, which bothered him a lot. And when he wants to give us a hug, he used to do it with only one hand. Now he gives a full hug and says, you see, I can do it. I'm a big boy now. Of course, his hand isn't fully functional yet, but together with the left hand, it works somehow, and he doesn't reject it. Perhaps the most fascinating aspect of reconnective healing is that it can be learned. Now, I didn't believe that this was something one can learn. I thought it was something only Eric was capable of doing. I didn't think I could acquire these skills too and help you my neighbor, my friend. But in the course of the program, right away we saw for ourselves that yes, you can indeed learn to help others. If you see the living example standing in front of your eyes, as we see our own child, then I think that yes, you believe it. There are a 
amazing healings taking place all the time. Yet, traditional allopathic medicine has no model or explanation for how these healings can occur. We don't understand how it is that even the simplest thing, like uh, you know, the healing from a wound that is so mundane that every child has experienced it, we don't have a full understanding of how that occurs. The answers may lie in the fundamental shift which is occurring in our understanding of our universe. Virtually every ancient culture and every native culture has thought of the universe as a unity, as a circle, and man is being central to that. And it was only with the discoveries of Isaac Newton and René Descartes that ripped us out of the fabric of our universe and created this clockwork model where mind is separate from body and that we are separate from each other. And that idea of separation is the foundation of Western thinking. Now Newton described a very well-behaved universe of separate things operating in space and time according to fixed laws. The idea of the body as machine, the body is this well-behaved machine with the two engines of the body being the brain and the heart and the whole central orchestra being conducted by DNA. That's the model we have and we think of various processes being localized in certain parts of the body. What's wrong with that is just about everything. Body is completely decentralized. There is no central brain in a sense, and that the brain is closer to a, an antenna receiver. It's closer to a transducer of information, a receiver and a transmitter of information, but not the central repository of that information. In our conventional world of uh, biochemistry and cellular biology, we focus on a Newtonian belief of a material world. Through the history of science, we focus on the mechanical reality and have let go of the concept of energy and fields uh, as information in biology. That's a Newtonian perspective that says, focus on the matter, don't pay attention to the rest of the stuff. Except that we're now recognizing that the mind, which is an energetic field of thought, which you can read with uh, EEG wires on your brain, or even more interesting is a new process called magnetoencephalograph called MEG. While electroencephalograph, you put wires on the skin and read brain activity. Magnetoencephalograph is a probe outside of the head, and it reads the fields of neural activity without even touching the body. So it basically says that when you're processing with your brain, you're broadcasting fields. 1875 to 1920 was this enormous growth of biochemistry and it was then thought that chemistry is probably, you know, we're a chemical machine. The answer is to put the right chemical in the body and you'll get better. To a point, that's correct, but it doesn't appear to be correct for chronic disease. It's correct in the short term. There was a major intellectual split going on at the time in physics because the old Newtonian world, the clockwork universe, uh, was, was going strong and a few crackpots in Denmark, Germany and to a lesser extent England developed quantum physics and said that uh, it doesn't work the way you said it works. It doesn't happen like that. And uh, there were huge anomalies found in physics that could not be explained. And the upshot of this was that the old idea of a mechanical universe, where everything happens for a specific reason in its own way, had to be dropped. Quantum physics changed our perception of reality over 80 years ago. Surprisingly, this new viewpoint has yet to be incorporated into our current biology model. The main problem with the current biological model is that it's reductionist and mechanistic. That means First, it tries to explain everything in terms of little bits, generally molecules, because they're the smallest things in organisms. And secondly, it tries to treat the organism as a machine that works simply in terms of physics and chemistry. Chemical reaction in the body is supposed to be central, and the main reason it occurs, according to current theory, is through molecular collision so that one molecule collides into another and that's how they have this information. 
and, and how we have a cascade of chemical processes. Now, if you think of the usual cell, a cell is like a swimming pool, and molecules are like a couple of tennis balls in that swimming pool. And according to this theory, one tennis ball is supposed to find another tennis ball in this vast body of water and do so instantaneously. And that is supposed to account for all the millions of instantaneous activities that occur in our body at every second. And that's ludicrous. The existing control system of modern medicine is enzymes, hormones. Not consciousness, not emotions, not body field. All that is there as your control system is enzymes and hormones. And uh, we find this a bit inadequate to explain uh, the whole majesty of human behavior and sickness and the whole darn thing. It's impossible. Today's medicine still works on the old paradigm of physics, which dates back to the time of Newton and the primacy of matter. Modern physics has long ago eliminated that paradigm and understands that it is not matter, but mind or spirit, which is primary. Though it isn't defined as spirit, but as energy fields, as intelligent energy fields. We look to science as some sort of absolute truth and a, a story that's already been written. But the, the reality is that Science is a story told in installments, and every new chapter oftentimes refines or completely changes what has come before. This intellectual pendulum swing, and it's swinging towards the idea of holism and looking at how an entire system works together. Whereas, you see, the doctors began to look at how each individual cell works, and they got down to the cellular level. That's all been done for a hundred years. Great, we understand it a lot. But we don't understand how the cells talk to each other and how they deal with information. When I was 15 years old, I had a very serious motorcycle accident. I was on a motorcycle I shouldn't have been on. And we were hit by a car that uh, caused a very serious wound in my leg. Um, ended up with 66 stitches. At the point of impact, I clearly remember having an out-of-body experience where my consciousness watched my body tumbling through the air and ultimately landing. And it was sort of shocking to me when I kind of came back into the body. That said to me that perhaps my consciousness isn't just in my brain, but that it, it is imbued with more quality than that. And then as I was facing a very serious outcome, they talked about the possibility of having to amputate part of my leg. Uh, I remember laying with a cast from my hip down to my ankle and thinking about how to rally my immune system through my thoughts such that I could promote healing in my leg. And so I would lay on the couch and I would visualize my immune system and I could feel it tingling. I could feel the healing happening in my leg. And I didn't come from a medical family. I have no idea at all where this idea came from. But somehow it was noetic. It came directly to me that that was what I needed to do. And ultimately they took the cast off and I'm, you know, I'm a, a two-legged creature still, thank goodness. And so I think that there was something about, you know, my own personal experience with that, that healing, um, that there was something about recognizing that my mind was important to my body and my body was important to my mind that, that I just knew intuitively.